Yes, welcome to another Paper Studio Northumbria seminar. This is one that I try to do in all the paper research seminar series. And it's slightly different from the other, all the other presentations that you have in the sense that it is very, very conceptual as opposed to material, which is perhaps an assumption on my part that the others are not conceptual because they're not they are in one way or another but this really looks I hope hard at the idea that a blank sheet of paper is some sort of conceptual item in our lives and has a lot of significance and significance is linked to concepts it's very difficult to have significance without having a concept attached to that significance so that's what this is about um, Blank sheets of paper. Um, doing this seminar gets me in, into all kinds of trouble, as I keep saying. This got me into Suits Corner last time I did this uh, in private eye. Um, I don't. I don't think. I. What is. What is so strange about talking about blank sheets of paper? Very. Very odd. Perhaps by the end of this session, you can tell me if it's very strange to be so interested in the nature of blankness particularly when it's attached to material entities like pieces of paper. Um, some of you will have heard parts, or perhaps even all of this, because it follows a particular item, but I've got a new bit added to it this time that I haven't done before about value and paper. And um, um, it's mostly a presentation about... Uh, the Rawson's concepts of paper as a support or a ground for drawing. That's where all these ideas come from. And they're all in this book, um, Philip Rawson's book, Drawing in the Appreciation of the Art series that was published in, in the 1970s. Um, I feel, I mean, I must introduce it for those of you who don't know that Philip Rawson was a big influence on me uh, when I was at the Royal College, he was my tutor. He saw me through three years of, of Royal College torment and, uh, and out the other side and then became a personal friend and was someone who I talked with afterwards quite a, quite a lot in one way or another and always enjoyed his ideas and his ways of thinking. There are, the Philip Rawson drawing book is known to anyone who's interested in drawing. Either it's known because people are really fascinated by what's in it or it's known simply because it, it, they're sort of against it in some kind of a way. There's plenty of people who would argue that this is, this is the wrong approach to take to drawing. And that's, that's a, a, a discussion I'm, I'm up for and interested in. Um, it is a book I know very well. And so what I'm about to give you is, is what's in the book plus. It's what's in the book plus a number of ideas but I, I discussed with, with Rawson in the years after I first read this. I read this when I was at the Royal College in, in 1973. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking about is the way in which Philip Rawson is interested in drawing as something that happens on materi material supports throughout the environment. So being the kind of, um, you know, he wasn't, he was, a, he saw himself as a sort of artist, but he was primarily interested in culture, cultures of drawing, and cultures of expression and aesthetics and things like that. So he's something of a philosopher. He, his actual area of expertise was, was in Oriental studies, Indian art in particular, and was had a kind of very big general interest and for many years he was the director of the um, Gubenke Museum of Oriental Art at Durham University and I met him because uh, when Peter de Francia took over as head of painting at the Royal College of Art he, he invited Philip to become a, a member, a part-time member of staff and very quickly I met him through Peter de Francia and we began this kind of dialogue. Um, 
I'm going to talk about paper by beginning with Philip's discussion of the kinds of supports that the drawing is done onto and the way in which that shapes and makes us understand drawing as an activity. And I'm not going to start with his description of drawings on paper, I'm going to start with his description of a drawing on a Sousa pot. When Philip talked about drawing, um, he would be moving from an Australian Aboriginal drawing on a pebble to a Michelangelo drawing on a fragment of paper to something done on a leaf in India to something scratched across a field in, you know, somewhere. I mean, that's, for him, drawing was, was a, a fundamental intellectual, emotional, sensual activity in its own right. He wasn't in, much interested in the idea that drawing is some kind of support for painting or sculpture or something like that. He was much more interested. He, 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 his big thing in life was really to go, keep going around saying, actually, drawing is more important than those things. It's something that's shared by more people than those who are interested in painting and those who are interested. Everybody draws in some kind of a way, even if it's just drawing a map to show someone the way. And drawing is, is a fundamental way of thinking. That's quite important. And so it seems important, that, and, the, and the idea he had about drawing is what I'm about to tell you, really. And this, this, if we start with this example of uh, the Sousa pot, um, I, can, I can give you a very quick synopsis. He just begins by describing the way that you might, as this pot comes, cools down having been in a kiln and been fired in like, I don't know, 500 BC or whatever, it, however old it is, comes the way that in which this would be handled, the way in which most of its meaning, until it's made very, very visual, is, is to do with something that is used for containing, is held, is passed around in some kind of way. And because of that, as someone imagines what the visual significance of that as it starts to take place, that actually you can't divorce the two. So the fact that it's round, the fact that it can be passed around, the fact that you can rotate it, the fact that you can hold it and look into it and it has a base, you can make it stand on things, you can turn it. All these things are the coordinates by which the drawing begins to happen. And the idea of how, I mean, it, perhaps it's wrong to call this a, a sort of visualisation, but the sort of thing that happens as an artist begins to draw a shape, on that, a sort of picturing, a sort of dividing up of that space. He's not really dividing up a piece of paper like that. Actually, he or she, quite likely to be a she, in fact, um, is dividing up the experience of holding and moving this object around in the hand. They are not dividing up a spatial area in the sense that we divide up a wall and decide to paint one side green and the other side. You know, that sort of thing. He's it's something which is related to the relation between this and that. And so, to begin to curve some kind of window space into that is, is for Philip an idea about space as limitation, right from, right from the start. You are limiting and defining and dividing space up. But not space in our flat world where we talk, think about space as planar, but something which is physical, tangible, volumetric, rounded, curves, that sort of thing. It's really important. So, actually, as some, you know, for whatever reason, some kind of um, form of representation starts to build, this becomes a pictorial space, and in it, some heavily symbolic creature starts to take place, those coordinates are still informing the way in which the shapes are being formed. They're still limited, enclosing, defining, and making you understand. This, of course, is a recombination of those, of those qualities. So it's as though in your imaginative, imaginative workings you st as you draw, you, begin, you mix and play, uh, mix together and improvise with 
the elements that you start with. So already we're talking about the kind of construction of meaning or the making of sense as a kind of additive, accumulative process that's filled with improvisation. And so it goes on with each, each element as it's added is, is in some kind of di dialogue with its coordinates. And actually, as you start to see how, the way in which the drawing is slowly pulled into a representative format with a tail and the goat's beard and then all these patterning and then the forms that are all the way around, yes, there'll be reasons that they're there, like, this animal means a lot in our culture, etc., etc. But the realization of it is very, very special from Philip's point of view. It's not just simply that these coordinates are being played with all the time and being responded, and they're helping to define the way in which you shape things, but actually the way that this speaks about the world of goats, the world of animals, is absolutely special. It's as though they are being brought into existence in our understanding in that kind of a way. And if you are a Sousa person using a Sousa pot, this is your world of goats that's that is attached to the world of pot using. And that, in a nutshell, and perhaps a little bit schematically put, is the way in which Rawson explored the ontological nature of drawing itself. In other words, we actually, we are defining what's in the world all the time through this kind of process. It's not picturing something that's already there, it's kind of inventing what's there, again, in front of all the time, and learning and making sense of it in this sort of way. And the other side of that coin is that it's performative, I suppose is the quickest way to say it. It starts somewhere, you know, and it, then it happens again, and then it happens again, and slowly it comes into place. So it doesn't, for Rawson, the drawing is never an image. It's a sort of insult to the drawing. The drawing is some kind of performative act that's unfolded. And when you look at a drawing, the unfoldedness of it is like, you know, 75% of the meaning of it. Because one thing has always followed another. And, and the reason drawing is fundamentally an art form in its own right is that it's the place that you see that. If you talk about drawing, it's not enough to draw, define drawing as, say, something that's done with a pencil rather than a paintbrush, because that clearly isn't the case. You can draw with a paintbrush, you can draw with a roller, you can draw, you know, you can draw any. What's important about drawing that doesn't happen in the same way in painting and sculpture is this clear statement of sort of ontological unfolding. I hope that, is that reasonably clear? Yeah. Um, the reason why it wouldn't happen in painting and sculpture is that there are lots of paintings that are more or less drawings, but the point of the painting is often that a lot of that is covered over to produce a more completed finished kind of surface than you would do, you would do in a drawing, and similarly with sculpture. And that would be his, you know, very roughly put, his, his distinction between those things. And of course there are drawings that aspire to the condition of paintings in which the surface is very carefully surfaced over to try and take away its drawingness. I can't leave Charles Sanders' purse out of anything. This is my hero. And, um, and yet he wasn't an artist, but he was a mathematician. And I think there's a very interesting contrast to be made with the way that the inventor of semiotics, the person who thought about significance probably harder than anyone in history, really, had a very strong feeling about the act of drawing as part of his, of his way of thinking. Before he got round to inventing semiotics, he was very busy inventing a mode of logic which was entirely visual. And actually, 
what this process is called is a process of graphic logic, which has never been adopted by anybody except Charles Holmes Peirce, like a lot of things that he did. It didn't go very far. But people are still writing about it and still very interested in it because what he did was he said where in an equation you would use brackets, you could actually use a process of enclosure drawing. And this is what he meant. And it follows on really interestingly from what we've just been talking about. That wasn't me. That was this. You take a blank sheet of paper, which he called the site of enunciation. And on it, you begin by giving a value to something which you enclose. That becomes some kind of entity that you could give a value to, like B or X or something like that in, in your, as you're doing your calculus, right? But what's interesting, and there's a lot of semiotics hanging on this next move, if you do this, it reverses it, just as brackets do. So this now is back being part of the site, and this is the value. It's really clever. <coughs> and it's, it entails a lot of semiotic idea, Persian semiotic ideas. It involves a lot to do with the way in which one um, circular lines can be seen to resemble entities in, in the world, like outlines. Right? He would call that an iconic relationship between things. So this circle looks like a donut. That would be an iconic relationship. It's also an indexical relationship because I, it's a trace of me doing it. And if you think about what I've just described, the Sousa Pot artist, most of the things I've been talking about carry a great deal of what Peirce would call indexical meaning. That is, they are the trace of that man or woman's mind at work on that pot. And it's possible for somebody looking at it now to kind of work out like a detective or a doctor trying to get to some kind of illness, work their way back and interpret it. So someone like Philip Rawson, looking at that pot in the British Museum in 1960, goes, right, surely that started with the act of holding that pot. Maybe that's why that drawing looks like it looks. That's an indexical interpretation that involves cross-references to the resemblance between those marks and the pot shape itself, which is an iconic relationship. But because actually we're working in abstract quant qualities, it also has a symbolic value because we're attaching values to it just linguistically by saying, you know, by, by convention. And so it goes on, and you can calculate in various kinds of ways and keep reversing backwards and forwards the values of things, just as you would in an equation doing, following the mathematical. And that's the sort of thing, this is what it looks like when you're actually doing it. Now, an interesting thing about what he, what he did, Peirce rather than Rawson, is he, he called these cuts. That's he cutting. Because he sort of saw it as a way of taking the surface of a pe the sight of process of thinking, of possible significance, and cutting the space out of it. Which is more or less what Philip is saying about taking the pot, starting to divide it, subdividing, being the, the the main creative process, which is then made to echo and reflect and respond to the first, the first shape, is followed by the second shape, and so it grows and grows and grows through a process of subdivision, echoing, resemblance, trace, all these things working together to make this happen. 
And I think it's really interesting that, that Peirce thought of this as a kind of cutting process, a subdividing process. Cuts. Now Rawson's interesting drawing spans, takes the, all those ideas across a huge range of ontological possibilities. And at, one, at some point, space as limit, as he's calling it here, that is this process in which all the meaning is somehow constructed by subdivision, one subdivision followed by another subdivision, is then ex starts to drift into another kind of value which he called space as environment. There are lots of descriptions of space as environment. He's not, um, he's not a, uh, like an art historian associating these ideas with particular cultures or particular times, although, of course, that happens a bit. But he's quite likely to say, oh, you start to see traces of space as environment in you know, ancient Egypt or something like that, as much as you are in the Renaissance or something like that. The Dura drawing, which is one of his kind of interesting descriptions. He does what I just described with the Sousa pot, with this Dura drawing, except the values are all to do with space as environment as opposed to space as limit and enclosure and divide. So, um, if you were ever taught by Philip Rawson, he would walk into your studio space, he would sit down and he'd say, oh, well, let's see some drawings put some drawings out on the floor in front he'd sit there and he'd go um, oh that's where you started and then he'd say well then you drew that and then you drew that and then you drew that and he was kind of nearly always right it was infuriating it, just, you, it was as though this person was kind of you know like sort of Sherlock Holmes working his way back through what you've done your traces to a point of order. And the reason it's important because the kind of seed ideas, like the, that first inversion of the pot shape in the, in the goat body and its legs, is for him like the beginning of a whole uh, unfolding story which happens in the drawing. Can I just say something about um, representation in all of this? He may, he, he wasn't saying this is form and then there's content. What he was saying is the two are working all the time together. So the pot is a kind of content and it's a kind of form. So is that first statement, etc. They're always in dialogue in some kind of a way. And this piece of paper, which in 1516, Dürer picked out and started drawing. And according to Philip, this is where he started drawing. And it started drawing a figure. And the way in which these curved lines loop out and around, you know, that's, what, that's what's interesting. He's saying that's why we should, that's why we find this drawing so compelling. It's just that wonderful order of lines as they unfold and, in, and begin to shape this sort of folding sequence of body parts. And you can tell what's going on spatially simply because one thing, you know, this must have been drawn after that because it's placed behind it. This, you know, very simple ideas, but everything hung on these kind of things for Philip. You need to read the book to get the richness of this kind of idea. But the point about this is that it's not dividing up the space. Something else is happening. What's happening is you're beginning to get the space, special value of the paper there in its own right. And this is somehow being hung in that space. And what happens is it starts somewhere and it unfolds and you end up with this. And for, for Philip, that's a kind, it's not just a subject unfolding in space, but by the time you get to this kind of space as environment, you, it's almost like a play unfolding, you know? There's this person, and then there's that person, that person who's looking at that person. Who must... So it's as though there's a kind of drama, and you can almost feel a story. You can almost feel them speaking to one another, speaking parts in a play. And it's something like that that would, of course, inform a painting. You know, those Poussin drawings, 
that you can feel him trying out the dialogue, the play, for a painting. He'd be lost in the painting, as in the sense that we're talking about it here. It would be somehow surfaced over and smoothed out. But, but in the drawing, you can see the raw, this person talks to that person, this person looks at this person. But underneath all of that is this curve goes in front of that curve, this curve is an extension of that curve, this one's a wider one of that, this one, you know, that sort of thing. And I think another quite important thing to say about that is that Philip's main analogy for this process is always a musical one. You know, he was um, a musician himself, he's married to an opera singer, very, very interested in temporal expression things moving through. And if you, you know, if you, if you play a lot of music, this falls into place absolutely immediately. You know, you start with a bunch of notes, you turn them upside down, you move them around, you play them twice the speed four times, and then spread them out over about ten bars, and then you do the, you know, that's exactly what it feels like to play something. And I, and I, and, and that was his, you know, that's how he talked about this, really. But instead of sound entities, sound units, we're talking about different kinds of visual, sensual, physical units of some kind, like, for example, a pot with a certain kind of silhouette, a certain kind of roundness that then becomes an interestingly strange shape on the, on the side of the pot that looks like a couple of legs. He, he would talk about not representation, he would talk about something he called the tenor, a musical analogy again, meaning as you make this process represent things, you're imagining the structure of the world ontologically that would hold all this expression in, in place in some kind of way. So there's some kind of relationship between the curving, naked body, this position against that position against you, and those kind of spatial entities. So they're all working together in this really interesting way. But he didn't have much. He wasn't. He was really, really uninterested in the idea that you needed to observe things, like lots of drawing of things. He he thought it was always a conceptual activity, and what you needed was you needed it in your head, in the same way that you you know you learn a lot of pieces of bark or something. Yeah, it's good to have the music in front of you, but actually what you need is is somehow you need the idea of of it in your head, and it just comes out, you know, in this kind of way. And he liked that idea of people who could, um, like, um, like Indian um, cinema poster painters who did it in public, as it were, as a kind of performative act. You know, he thought all of that was really interesting. So that's space is limit and space is environment. And in fact, in the book, um, he, he takes you through lots of examples of these. And, and tests it against different kinds of um, types of drawing, not just on paper, but on objects and all kinds of things. Um, so, for example, the, the point of, in the book where it's introduced, he uses this rather beautiful little Indian drawing, which is on a leaf, and says that's space is the limit, and it's about subdividing that existing object in some kind of way. And then for space as environment, he uses this uh, Chinese drawing, and he talks about the way in which there, you know, it fails to enclose. It just hangs things in, in that space. And another thing to say about it is that the space here conceptually seems to, you've had enough by the time you get to the edge of the object. It's not as though, you know, it's an, it's an encapsulation or or concentration of space. Whereas with something like a, um, a Chinese scroll, for example, there's a feeling in which the space goes on forever around, you just, you're just getting a window onto it. You don't get that there. And what goes with space as environment, in a way, you don't get quite the same thing with space as, uh, as limit is this idea of this linear pathway that everything unfolds 
after everything else, and I'll come back to this in a minute, and I'm going to try and do some drawing about it in a minute. Um, so it talks about shadow paths and the European tradition of, of actually constructing the whole image around pathways of shadows. Lots of it comes, he says, from um, still life drawings and landscape painting and that sort of thing. The important thing to say about it is that everything is held together really by that kind of progression. And it's good if you can sense where it starts and how it unfolds and how it moves through space, you get this extraordinary journey of the kind that I tried to show you with the Dura drawing. And an extension of that, but um, you get someone like Suzanne. Suzanne used to talk about this as a kind of cutting into the surface, which is exactly what it looks like. Which kind of takes us round and back to Perth. The idea that the surface of the paper has a value in its own right, which you then cut through and alter in some kind of a way. So we might, if we were to make, it, make a rather general statement about the difference between space's limit would be where you take something and you, and you start to cut it up as an object in the world. Space's environment would be where you start to puncture through a, a surface which actually already suggests space. And, that, and all, it would be wrong to think of this as some kind of historical analysis, because it actually he's just interested in this ontological value. The things we're talking about are ontologies. They are what we think is in the world. And of course, there's a huge difference between thinking what's in the world is something that's continually subdividing to something which is unfolding through a limitless space. These are like entirely different mindsets. And I think, you know, if I understand Philip's position right, he would say, if we move backwards and forwards between these ideas throughout history, you know, out the window, all these ideas about style and all that. It's nothing to, you know, these are, these are misrepresentations. Of what, we're, of what we're talking about here. So, <clears throat> I think there's quite a lot of um, things that are almost impossible to talk about in this process. I mean, when I came in today, I, I bought uh, a, a role, this is, I, I think this is quite conceptually cheeky, but put some newsprint into the paper, so I said, you know, the cheapest, all this kind of paper. And I've always loved drawing on newsprint, and actually, when I used to sell a lot of drawings, I always used to worry about what was going to happen, and I met someone recently who bought a lot of drawings, no, who been to a house which has a lot of my drawings in from the 1970s, which were all done on newsprint. And I said, um, what do they look like then? You know, expecting her to say, there's nothing left, they've all faded. She said, I was greatly relieved saying, actually, no, they look really good, they're a bit brown, <laughs> as you'd expect. One of the things I liked about drawing on it is it's just this very thin, smooth surface. For some reason, I always found it attractive, and when even with quite expensive papers that I might use now, I, I'm always trying to get something as close to this. So maybe you, a few oh, hints. Yeah, yeah, I need some support here. But um, the, import, the point is that, because this is really cheap, crap paper, it really <laughs> emphasizes the conceptual level at which I'm working at, right? <laughs> no, um, no pleasure in the sense of it being rich in value. So the values are conceptual that I'm after, and so anything that I decide to do as space is, space by the limit is already, you know, about the way our minds operate in relation to this. And 
It's so simple if you just do that, and you're already, you know, is that in front of this? And is that something that's behind it? And is that in the distance? And particularly if I start to do that, you know, I'm, all, I'm already going somewhere. Like maybe that's a hole, and maybe this is an object, maybe that's, a, maybe that's a space going back that way, you know, this kind of thing. If I was to do that, that curve going across there would be in some sort of sense a response to, to this. And actually, because I set this up beforehand, I did notice that the first thing I did in order to do space as limit was fold the paper in half to make it smaller. And then I suddenly thought, that's really important, you know? This is folded. It's already doing what I'm talking about. Just to fold it is the beginning of that. Just like picking up the pot and thinking, mm, you know, that folding of the paper is a limiting action that encloses. This seems so simple, but it seems to me to dominate so much of what we do. If, for example, I was to take, well, let's see, a space like that, having got this far, I start to think, you know, maybe some kind of spatial entity that fits in there which works in relation to, like that. I'm responding to the corners, some kind of way, moving them. And picking up on the curve of that. Now, what's interesting about this kind of arrangement that doesn't happen in space as environment is that where is that? You know, I think one of you know, if you think about those medieval drawings and and relief sculptures where the figures seem to hover in front of the picture plane. That seems to me to be a product of space as environment. There's something uh, space as limit. There's something about space as environment is about punching back through a, a thick fog of whiteness into the space. There's something about limit and its object orientation, thing orientation, that allows you to put something on a surface or just in front of it in some kind of way. And it, you know, it's greatly improved by some, you know, if you start giving things legs and making them look as though they might be hovered, hovering in front of, you know, something, then you're, you're beginning, that's, that's what he meant about the tenor, you know? The tenor's coming to play. I didn't know what I was going to draw a few seconds ago. I'm already busy rolling down a particular tenor. In order to make those ideas work. Some of the relationships between these, so if you think about Paul Clay, for example, a lot of the relationships will be across between things. The relation of this to that, the relation of this to that, you know, the relation of that to this. And I don't know what to say about that other than to point it out to you that it's, you know, like being quite good at playing an instrument, you, you develop these sort of... Um, good feelings about relationships between things. Partly because you see them all around you, but partly the doing of it seems to insist that you have some kind of um, engagement at that level with it. You know? You're never quite copying anything. You're never just doing it. You're always doing it because it seems to add in some sort of a way. And modifications are often just attempts to reinforce this, or to, like on the Sousa pot, you know, to start to to add um, new bits of representation that add to the tenor, that keep taking on that step further. And I suppose, you know, if I if I was to take the trouble, I could take this right the way through to some kind of realistic drawing of some kind of winged rat standing in you know, some place, you know, and, that, and it could look as though that was what I was drawing. But in fact, 
all of it would have been made up as long to long. There is some, there are, in the book there are some really nice descriptions of drawings that were done over and over again. Egyptian, uh, Greek vase drawings where they're clearly following formula. But what's interesting about that is, of course, is that just like continuing to play, you know, a bar prelude over and over again, it's never the same each time you do it and, and you feel your inventiveness within that system. So if we move then to the other side of it, to the space as environment, I'm already looking at a piece of paper where I'm not worried so much about this because actually these are, these are just sort of arbitrary divisions for me that just happen to be at the edge of the paper. Really, that space there goes on like forever as far as I'm concerned. And so as I start to make a mark you know, in, in there and hang it there in that space, I'm in another world altogether. And actually, I'm very unlike, like, unlikely to think I'm going to sort of subdivide these things up in some sort of way. I'm likely to keep making that journey, you know, perhaps to do with overlaps, moving back, and, and, and slowly, bit by bit, all of these things And just as this to this to that to that, there's something else happening here, isn't there? You know, these chains of possibility all the time. And even though I'm, you know, I don't know what I'm really doing, I'm just following my one mark after another. Even now, just looking at that, I can see that, you know, how important it was to make that kind of hole start to appear there, that I could then move this into that sort of slightly more extended curving shape and how you know bit by bit I'm beginning to make it do form things and so on and so on and so on and you could just keep going because as you're working bit a bit like the way in which color works you know you these, these become tremendous sort of textual energies with values that are very similar to color you know if I get to here and it's starting to look this kind of thing you know the way in which the marks, just think of um, Van Gogh drawing, all these sort of, you know, the way the whole space just starts to unfold in this kind of a way, and it's full of, full of, um, not, not just representations of dark to light and tone, but also of energies, and that sort of thing. You know how in the Cezanne drawing, the sort of front drops off into space in the same way as the distance does. Those, those sorts of things. These are, these are to do with space as environment. They wouldn't happen in this kind of scenario. So we're, you know, we're at two ends of a scale. And of course, there are loads of stages in between this. Lo you know, perhaps all of us, to a certain degree, um, work somewhere in between all of this all the time. I think what's interesting is that You tend to sort of reach your conclusion through some sort of decorative arrangement on a surface this way. At this end, you know, your unity is something like the unity that comes out of a very successfully structured piece of music where you feel the beginning and the end somehow have a, a proper journey right the way through the middle. Which is why Philip puts such an emphasis on first mark to last mark type journeys. And remember, he's not just talking about indexicality. He's not just saying, oh, it's interesting that the artists felt like this at the beginning and then felt like this at the end, and this is the trace of that journey. It's actually that the sort of statement about what's real, what's there, is part, is, comes out of that, out of that step-by-step -step journey.
I made some notes on here, wondering if I could get through all these different points. No, I think I've more or less covered the things that I think I can say. I mean, you may, may raise some questions that I might be able to answer. As, um, but I, do, I want to kind of try and take it one step further, having done, done that, by, by just introducing one more complication. Um, Um, space's limit, think about that pot, think about that beautiful leaf in the Indian, in the Orissa drawing. Um, think about some precious kept stone. Think about some wonderful temple building. The, spaces limit on the surfaces that divide up and extend that building visually in some kind of a way. The value is associated with the object in some kind of a way, right from the start, so it's a great pot. You know, the drawing is already doing pretty well. Presumably a, a terrible pot could be made a lot better by somebody who's really good at drawing, that sort of thing. Interestingly here, It, doesn't, it seems to me that the whole idea is that somehow the kind of whiteness, the environment, the space itself is a conceptual value that is not necessarily to do with what the paper is. You know, I think if this was a really beautiful piece of paper, something else would be happening quite quickly with this drawing. Here, maybe it's not quite so important, or maybe it is. And it's these kind of questions, because... At the, we've, we talk about, I've, I've talked about, tried to introduce the idea of the role of resemblance in signification in, in the philosophies of Charles Sanders Peirce, the role of indexicality of trace in Charles Sanders. But there's a point at which you can take a piece of paper and you can say, actually, this is worth £10. And then you're in something, you're in a, you know, if this was a, a a note from the 1960s, I could tear it up and it wouldn't matter anymore, sort of thing, perhaps. If this was a... Where were they from? The... Uh, Scott. Um, Scott. Scott, but they were Chinese, Chinese. banknotes, weren't they? And, and a ship sank or lost its, its load of printed money and they, land, they came up on the beach and people used them as wallpaper. Now, the value here would be symbolic in the sense that purse meant symbolism, something which is attached, something, a value that has to be learned as opposed to is self-evident. Iconic value, resemblance, this looks like a landscape, is immediate and always understood by the mind. And actually, you can look at it and say, oh, it looks like a tree, and I can say, oh, it looks like a stream, and we'd both be right and it wouldn't matter. That's, that's the nature of resemblance and the signification to resemblance, which is why we all argue about art all the time. If we're talking about indexicality, we're a, we're a bit like a doctor trying to pick up symptoms and understand how something's coming to be. That's a different kind of activity. It's, it involves some kind of a degree of experience and understanding and sensitivity and perception, those kind of things. But actually, to know that's worth £10 and that you can buy something with it, involves learnt cultural knowledge of some kind. And that's what he meant by the symbolical. And it just interests me that we've been talking a lot about the value of blankness being turned into something here. This is the kind of ult ultimate symbolical version of that. And if I was... Well, I wouldn't do it. I find it very difficult to tear this up now. Pass it to me. <laughs> well, you may. 
but it's my money. <laughs> and I just thought this would, be, this would make a very interesting project, make a very interesting exhibition. So I've been talking to Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, who have a massive collection of currency. <coughs> and it does seem, even just from this, this first case, I mean, they go all the way down this, this aisle, and these, there's a lot of coins, there's a lot of objects in there which have, have been used as currency. Um, but their value is always symbolic in some sort of sense. So, um, you know, there, there are silver coins that are worth the amount of silver that they're made of. You know? There are, um, there, there's the hair from a special bat in China, which is the most valuable, was the most valuable trading currency in a particular part of China. But again, the rarity and the monetary value attached to it is symbolic. There's also just here a, a tin of fat that was used as currency during the <coughs> Korean War. There's also, um, it's that card there, I think, a row of safety pins that were given a small change in Oxford Market in the 20s when they didn't have any cap, when they didn't have any money. So they were trading in small goods. I think people still do it, actually, in markets. But there's also bits of paper with performative statements written on them. I promise to pay the bearer on demand so much gold, so much silver, whatever it happens to be. And it seems to me that what we've just been talking about is that kind of performativity that Philip is so interesting in. But, I mean, we're not talking about drawing now, we're just talking about statements, verbal statements, that sort of thing, where this is meant, this is a, this is a speech act of some kind that says, actually, at some point, if you wanted the same amount, the, this value in silver or whatever, we, we, the Bank of England or whatever, would give it to you. That, and that, that makes it like that. This very early Ming Dynasty, circulating <coughs> treasure notes, isn't it lovely? It's a very, very early piece of paper money. This, this is um, this early, well, it's not that early, 1777 American note. The, um, the performative statement on it is, to counterfeit is death. <laughs> isn't that wonderful? Now, well, just let me finish what I'm saying, just quickly, because we've got obviously a lot, lot of things we could talk about. I'm going to do a show about this with the Pitt Rivers, and I'm inviting you to participate. So if you have some ideas about how to do this, start telling them to me, because what I'm interested in is paper, value, sim symbolism, symbolical structures in the Persian sense, and if you want some more Pers. There are several of us in this room that can provide you with it. <laughs> um, but you don't have to. Um, or just some, some sort of way in which working with paper, making paper, fits with that kind of theme. I mean, I'm right at the beginning of it, so improvise away and we'll get, get to it. I mean, we could do all kinds of things, from make things for the pit through to do things like this, workshops, Making, you know, we could do all kinds of things and they'd be happy. Um, well, we could even do tearing up money. Maybe I could just cut in yeah. here and say obviously the, the studio gives some kind of possibility as a platform. We're going to present it as a, you know, as a paper studio in Northumbria so project. Again, if people project. want to, yeah, people want to use the studio in some way or, you know, work with Jane, I'm sure that, you know, there's, some, there's so many interesting possibilities. So think about it because I think this is a really, it, it offers so many possibilities. Yeah, I mean at the moment it's big and open and, and of course as we proceed it will get narrower and narrower but, but actually that's past the point isn't it? By the time we get to here, what else, what other choices do I have? They get smaller and smaller as I start to think oh it's a, you know, it's a tree standing by a lake. <laughs> there, I, that's, that's about all I've got to say I think except 
answering questions and trying to find out. Any rubbish I've spoken? Well, first of all, thank you very much. <laughs> about how, because uh, there is the sense of currency is usually based on the idea of equivalency of value, really, and I find the whole status of how a piece of paper has the statuary significance to actually think of, this can value such a significant mm -hmm. amount, however, the, the, the the days of equivalent exchange is becoming much more difficult to find, really, because people change the values all the time. Yes. Well, Mary Mellor will be, I hope, participating in this project, and she's a sociologist who writes about sociology of money, and I think she would point to that in answer to your question to counterfeit. So in fact, that equivalence is, is more to do with the society than it is to do with the economy in all these situations. The fact that they they mean it is what we're talking about. Really, we're not talking about whether it's worth ten pound, four pounds, or whatever. Four pounds of silver, four pounds worth of money. Actually, the significant thing there is if you if you start trying to de change the equivalence in this, you defer it. <laughs> So it's a social, which is, fits with purse. That's what he, you know, the symbolical is always social. And it doesn't have a reality beyond that because, you know, that piece of money to us now means absolutely nothing. Another question. Um, you've talked about the space of environment and the space of limits. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I kind of got that one. Um, but I was interested in the idea of um, an artist who, I can't remember his name, but he did the Erasure Act where he actually mm -hmm. where he actually erased an actual image. Mm -hmm. And it just changed the value of it entirely by actually mm -hmm. transgressing that act. Well, yeah. Think about that from the point of view of what we've been talking about. What do you think he was doing? I think he was trying to create. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm well, as a drawing process, what do you think he was doing? What was the end result of that process? Well, exhibited was it a blank piece? Of, was, well, was it more could, just no, with, with, with kind of yeah, a, redu marks, a reduced yeah. Yeah. Thing, really. mm -hmm. But that's the thing. By reducing it, you supposedly have created. Are reducing it in its value. Well, I'm just saying he was drawing with a rubber um, over another drawing. Mm. And one was by Rauschenberg and one was by de Kooning. Mm. And I think nearly everything we've been talking about is stands. It's just it was under the rubber rather than a piece of charcoal or whatever. Well, conceptually, was he really moving space? Or no. Or adding a new kind no. of space? Well, just, just look, I mean, if I now start working over this, that's all he would have been doing. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, the fact that he's. Well, both de Kooning and Rauschenberg are big users of space as environment, so yeah. it would be working in this kind of a way. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but if you were saying... I mean, Rauschenberg, yeah. even though he's collaging, still has this sort of space, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. Everything but, sort of hangs in some... what I'm saying is, mm. if, if the first drawing carved into that space, yeah. if you then erase that, are you... Well, that's only like space, going right? over the top of oh, yeah. other marks, yeah. 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 I just think it's one drawing. Mm. It just happens to have two artists. I think, you know, if, if uh, I think Picasso drew over a banknote once, mm -hmm. he sent to him. I think that might be something a bit more like this, and that, that would be a bit different for me. Mm -hmm. where, where, where would you? Oh, sorry. I'm just impressed that I'm thinking about that piece of work I put in New York, and I see that obviously it's space of limit because I'm responding to the. You're talking about the book? Limits. Oh no, the paper. The paper mm -hmm. where I, Basically, I made some paper which had creases as I made it, and I was responding to the creases. But I'm also puncturing the paper, so I'm wondering whether it could be because she was bothered. Well, this is, this is the, the heart of puncturing as mm -hmm. drawing. Yeah. You know, by going through the surface, does it become space as environment? Um, 
environment as well. You see, I'd say the answer to that is conceptual, not physical. I mean, you could do either. Mm -hmm. I could have done all of this by pinpricks yeah. or that, and it would still, I mean, you're just, you know, you're making marks of mm -hmm. some kind. But the added idea of that somehow you're, you're breaking the surface just seems to, you know, increase some sort of idea. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I'm not sure, you know, when we're talking about ontologies, we're not always talking about the same as expression, for example. You can have all kinds of special meanings that are attached. The ontology is just what we think is in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, whether we think there are smooth things with continuous surfaces all over them, or whether we think the whole world is jumbled up into atoms, or whether we, you know, that sort yeah. of thing. Which informs everything we think we say about things, but you know, um, which is why Philip is always sort of really working at the level of language rather than content. But it's a bit more than just um, grammar. <laughs> mm. Chris, where where would you or Lawson put very precise perspectival drawing in this? It could be either, I think. Because you could have, like, like certain early Italian versions of perspective, like you're getting a new cello or something like that. It's very sort of on the surface and dividing up the existence mm. of a panel in some kind of a way. But yes, but conceptually into deep well, space. Well, yes, except that you can have that sort of, you can have what looks like a deep space in the Uccello. It's sort of coming up, folding up and hitting you all the time, isn't it? Doesn't always feel like, doesn't feel like this kind of deep atmospheric sort of space. But maybe, maybe it's somewhere in between, I don't know. Someone gave an interesting talk at the, um, you know, Hamilton Pasmore Fest two yeah. weeks ago mm. about uh, a late Hamilton print, I think it is, which is a perspectival drawing of a room with a chair in it, and a, with a black hole, but all the, the single vanishing point is labelled as a black hole, it has the idea of, yeah. of energy being mm. sucked into it, yeah. or then emanating out from it. Yeah. 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 I don't know, what do, what do others think? I, th I, th I think, in a way, this this is this is not a diff you know it's not they're not difficult ideas. Do they work in across lots of examples? I don't know. It'd be interesting to keep trying them out. Mm -hmm. you know. I think it's also interesting. I'm, I'm sort of thinking about this idea about you know drawing this environment, and I know that you've you've used the something like the expression about carving into the mm. whiteness. And it, it, it just could come to mind about another, another possibility for this, and I'm thinking about a kind of about an Oriental, Far Eastern idea of, of you know, for example, with a calligraphic mark, yeah. putting that mark onto a white piece of paper. So it's not, yeah. it doesn't feel like it's carving into the paper, but suddenly there's the, a kind of almost like an equal status between the mark and then what then exists. So then you add another yeah. mark, and so yeah. those. Those that, spaces that's that is a distinction emerge. within, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. that's what I'm kind of yeah. thinking. There are lots of, I mean, there are lots of variants. Different sort of mm. variants. Yeah. And, because um, what that, that difference is, is there's a tendency in the West to see that as shadow, but there would be a tendency in the East to see it as a body in its own right, which, which is, you know, is to do with um, ways in which we don't all see the world in the same way. And if you see the, the piece of paper as something that you're you're visually carving into, yeah. then the then the paper itself and the whiteness of the paper, in a way, yeah. remains yeah. in the same place. It has it remains holding the same value. Yeah. Whereas if you think mm. of the black mark going onto a white piece of paper, mm. and immediately yeah. they begin to have the same. Actually, that that's a very important point because that. That does, it's about the you know, status mm, of the mark in yeah. relation to, to, yeah, to yeah. the uh, paper support, whatever mm. you want. And, and I think that's something that, in, in a way, does feel a little bit mm. 
not missing, but it's mm. it's another it's an, it's, a, it's another kind of con way to think about this concept. Well, I, I, I yes, you see, I, I think it's kind of interesting. I mean, I, my feeling is that that this that this sort of works because the mark and the and the surface are seen to have the same value. Whereas I think perhaps at this end, it's much more to do with the object having the value. And somehow the drawing is there to divide up. So it's, like, um, it's like taking a pebble and drawing a line around it somehow.